from the dead by the glorious of the Father. Yes, now we also may live new lives. Next verse. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Thank you, Lord. We know that our old sinful selves, yes, with Christ, so that might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Who says amen? Verse 7, for died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Verse 8, and since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Verse 9, we are of this because was raised from the dead, and he will, death no longer has any power. Whoo, verse 10, when he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he, for the glory of God, hallelujah, verse 11, so should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and uh, to God through Christ Jesus. Verse 12, do not, do not give in to sinful desires. Hallelujah. Do not let any part of your become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give your completely to God, for you were dead, but now, so you're as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Yes, yes. Sin, for you no longer live under the requirement of the law. Instead, Hallelujah. Well then, since God's grace, does that mean we go on sinning? Of course not. <laughs> Don't you, that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. My, my, my. Thank God. Once you were, but now you obey this teaching we have given you. Verse 18. Now, and you have become slaves to righteous living. My 19. Because of the, I am using the illustration of slavery because of the, Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right, my Lord. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. Let's read these last two verses together. But now, last verse, now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Next verse, last verse. For the... Can we give God praise for just the reading of God's holy word? Take five seconds and just turn to your neighbor and tell them one thing that jumped out at you as you were reading that. Just one quick thing. Turn to your neighbor, tell them one thing that, whoo, that, that, that hit me when I, when I read that one piece. Thank you, Lord. Today, for the next few moments, I uh, want to talk about this chapter using the title, That Ain't Me. 
that ain't me. That ain't me. Not that isn't me. That ain't me. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Having come back, having come back from Kenya, my fascination with how my brothers and sisters live and conduct themselves within their community has been heightened. I'm actually wearing um, a top straight from Kenya today. Amen. They, they, they made it by hand. Uh, I chose the fabric myself. Uh, they, had a, they had a tailor right there in town, and he made this for me. Amen. Plus two more outfits. Amen. And so uh, by way of introduction, I would like to begin my message by speaking about uh, rites of passage. Uh, rites of passage play a central role in African socialization marking different stages in an individual's development, as well as that person's relationship and role to the broader community. Now, one of the major rites of passage in Africa, in African life, is the transition from childhood to adulthood. I'm going somewhere today. Now, it varies from community to community, and it varies from tribe to tribe, but generally speaking, there's a common pattern when a rite of passage takes place, okay? The first step is that they separate the group of teenagers from their usual surroundings, and they schedule them in an isolated place away from the community, and that's where they're tested, right? And that's where they're taught by their elders. The, the, the testing usually involves some type of demonstration of physical endurance. Uh, they may show some type of demonstration of mental strength and intelligence and fortitude. They undergo different types of experiences, and they do it. That The, the thing is, they got to do it without showing any sign of fear or um, express any kind of discomfort. This is what the rite of passage is. But this, this particular rite of passage stood out to me because this time of initiation signifies, here it is, essentially dying to their childlike self in order to be reborn into their adult self. That's why they do this whole rite of passage. This transition is important because for them, the child self must die in order for there to be a rebirth of who they are. And with that rebirth comes change. So much so that when they come back from their time of seclusion, they are reincorporated into the community as new people. They're literally considered new people. Sometimes, some tribes, they, they may shave their hair off as a sign that they're new people, right? Some tribes, their old clothes may be thrown away. Sometimes their clothes may even be burnt as a sign that they're new people. In some cultures, they even receive new names. I'm sure you've seen this. They get a completely new name because it's a symbolic way of letting them know that they're not the same person when they came back. They're new people now. And they're ready to take on new responsibilities and assume a new place within their community because of this rite of passage. And let me say here parenthetically before I go on that I think when I was reading this, I said, this, is sounds, this sounds really interesting. I think that maybe, you know, I think there's maybe pockets of it within our African-American community. But I think that this could be really valuable within the black community to help rectify the gaps in maturity and responsibility amongst our young people. There, there's like a, there would be a more clear delineation that you're grown now and you can't go back to being a child anymore furthermore as I was studying more and more about this I couldn't help but allow my mind to wander back to my own spiritual rite of passage I said I, I couldn't help but think about my own spiritual rite of passage. I, I was sinking deep in sin. That's my rite of passage. Uh, far from the peaceful shore. Very, very deeply stained within. You know the song. Sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea. He heard my despairing cry. And what does the song say? From the waters 
He lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? Anybody know what I'm talking about today? Do you remember the day when love lifted you? Do you remember the day when love lifted you from the miry clay? The day when you decided to make a U-turn and said, by faith, I will live a new life in Christ Jesus. You left some things. You left some people. You left some environments and said, I will follow you, my Savior, whatsoever my lot may be. I thank God that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to justify us. That's what we talked about last week. Justified us. Saved us from ourselves so that we don't have to continue down that road. Here's the problem. This is the problem. The problem is we've accepted what the gospel has done for us. We've accepted that the gospel can save us. We've accepted that the gospel can rescue us and deliver us. But we have forgotten what the gospel can do through us. Like the gospel can change us. The gospel can fix us. The gospel can elevate us, remake us. Because after a rite of passage, you do not go back to where you were before. Y'all don't hear me today. You don't go back to where you were before. See, see, the gospel in its most potent form will literally give a fatal blow to our old way of life. Go to that slide. It will give a fatal blow to our old way of life. The gospel in its undiluted form will literally eradicate your old way of living. But I believe there's this misunderstanding of the gospel. There's this mismanagement of the gospel. There's this uh, misplaced understanding of the gospel. To the point, help me Holy Spirit, that we think that we can go back to our old ways. And I say we because I'm talking to myself today. We think that we can go back to our old ways and stay there because of grace. We think that we can go back to our old ways of sinning and stay there. And it's okay because we have a friend called grace. So then, so then we go ahead and say things like, I've, I've done it, I've done it. I know it's wrong, but thank God for grace. You know, <laughs> I know I shouldn't be, I know I shouldn't be, I know I shouldn't be with her. I, I know I shouldn't be with him, but, you know, thank God I'm under grace. Uh, I, I know I shouldn't be smoking that. I, I know I probably shouldn't be getting drunk all the time, but, hey, thank God, thank God, thank God for grace. I, I know I shouldn't be going there. I, I know I shouldn't be doing this, and I know I shouldn't be doing that, but thank God for grace. And we use that as an excuse to keep on making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. I can't even believe I'm preaching this at Grace Community. The pastor of Grace Community has the audacity to stand in the pulpit today and say what I'm about to say. But I believe that this is the word of the Lord for this season, for this hour, for this people of God. I'm not talking to people that are not saved today. I'm actually talking to people that are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know you're baptized. You know that Jesus loves you. I came to preach to y'all today. The problem that's pervading the body of Christ, the problem that's permeating the body of Christ is that maybe, help me Lord, maybe we've taken grace a little bit too far. Maybe we are misusing grace. To be clear, so you don't misquote me, I'm not speaking about making mistakes here and there. Grace is always going to be there. Where grace, where sin abounds, grace will always abound. What I am saying is grace is not meant to allow you to stay in your sin. We don't need more sins to reveal God's grace. We need more lives to reflect God's righteousness. I will say it again. We don't need any more sins to reveal God's grace. We need more lives that are bold enough to reflect the righteousness and goodness of God. Somebody say amen. See, because in many of these African cultures that I was talking about that have forgotten about these rites of passage in order to be more westernized, 
they're now noticing amongst their young people that there's now more of a lack of achievement. There's a loss of motivation. There's a lot of confusion and chaos happening now. There's a loss of uncertainty. There's a loss of focus. There's a loss of identity. And I'm here to say similarly, when we forget our own spiritual rites of passage, we also risk getting confused about what the gospel is really about. We risk a lack of spiritual focus. We risk a lack of spiritual growth. We risk a lack of spiritual maturity when we forget what the gospel is really about. So this is why we have chapter 6. It messed me up this week. And I pray it messes you up too. So I'm not by myself. We in this together, okay? Paul is basically saying, I just spent the previous chapter breaking down the significant rite of passage called justification. I told you in chapter 5 that you have now been declared righteous. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, right, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done, right? So now he's like, I've already said that, made that clear. Now I need to remind the believers in Rome and now remind us how we can actually live out this gospel, how we can continue to grow in this gospel, how we mature in this gospel and not lose our focus and identity. Because when you have a firm understanding of the grace, you're not going to misuse grace, but you'll thank God for grace. Here we go. So I've been poking and I've been prodding these 23 verses all week. And I came up with, I could have come up with like six, but I don't want to strain you out. Three points to remember, uh, three points to remember that will help us overcome using grace as an excuse to sin. Get your papers, get your phones ready. Three points that's going to help us overcome using grace as an excuse to sin. First one, remember, you don't have to sin. Look at verse 1. You don't have to sin. (laughs) It sounds so simple, but it's so mind-blowing. Verse 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No. No. Verse 2, by no means. We are, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? In other words, Paul's saying, if you're dead to it, how can you live in it? If you're dead to it, how can you live in it? Okay, let me help you. So people have this thing about faking their death. (laughs) I don't know if you know anybody that's done that. I don't know anybody personally. Uh, but I'm sure you've probably seen it on various TV shows and 48 Hours and all those crime shows about people uh, who try and fake their death. There's actually a professional term for it. It's called suicide. Let the church say suicide. Yeah, yeah. There are several instances uh, where people have staged their death. Uh, you know, you've heard the stories. They, they stage their death because they want to collect that insurance money. Right? They stage their death. They fake their death. They pretend that they drown somewhere off in Lake Erie. I don't know. They do all those kind of things because maybe they want to escape having to go to jail. Right? Uh, or they w- sometimes people fake their death because they just want to run off with their new boo and leave their family at home. I'm sure you've seen it. But let me, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you something. When it comes to being dead to sin, you don't have to fake your death when you're dead to it. Like, you don't have to fake your death to pride. You don't have to fake your death when it comes to being dead to your selfishness and dead to your greed and dead to your immorality and dead to your lust. Do I have a church in here? You don't have to pretend like it happened because, no, dying to sin is real. Like, it actually happened. You are dead to it. What happens is, what happens is we fake our death to sin so that we can keep living in our sin. I mean, that's what they do. They, they, they fake their death so that they can go somewhere in, in, in Mexico and do whatever they want. 
And it is like that in the spirit. We often fake it so that we can keep living it. But you can no more respond to that sinful temptation, no more than a dead person can respond to it. That's what it means when Paul talks about it. When Paul says uh, it's dead to you, he's saying sin has power, but sin no longer has power over you. Your sin may have influence, but it no longer has influence over you. Sin, it can be controlling, but it no longer controls you. Who says amen? Does that mean that you're never going to mess up? No. Does that mean that you're not going to make a mistake? No. It means that you don't have to make that mistake. It means that you don't have to keep going back to that same old mess. You are dead to it. It's dead to you. You used to be dead in it, but now you're dead to it. You feel the difference? You used to be dead in it, but because of what Christ has done, now you're dead to it. Look at verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified. It was what? We, were, we know that our old selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Brothers and sisters, the liar that's in you is crucified. Come on, you don't want to believe it, huh? The cheater in you is crucified. The whoremonger in you is crucified. The immoral person that's in you is crucified. That angry person that used to rise up all the time is crucified, dead. That person no longer exists. The text says, for we know that our old self was crucified. That's how you stop using grace as an excuse to sin because you know that your old self was crucified when you were justified by faith anyway. So now I can live, I can live in the reality of a new me and no longer subscribe to that lifestyle of sin. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to be in the atmosphere of it. You don't have to tolerate it anymore. You don't have to be controlled by that sin anymore. And I think often as Christians, we end up misunderstanding grace because we forget this truth that we literally don't have to sin anymore. The reality is this. Go to the slide. Grace is not the freedom to sin. Grace is the freedom to choose not to sin. Let that marinate. Grace is not the freedom. Okay, yeah, I can mess up. God's going to forgive me. <laughs> That's not really what it's about. Grace is the freedom to choose not to sin. Literally changes my perspective on the struggles in my life. Next, we don't have to use grace as a license to sin because we're united with Jesus. Remember that you're united with Jesus. Look at verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Go to the next one. Since we have been what? Since we have been what? Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be what? Raised to life as he was. That's good news. Paul specifically uses the word united to imply an intimate and intricate connection. It's a union of two parties coming together. That's a good place to shout. I'll say it again. It's, it's, it's the, the word united implies a, an intimate connection. It implies a, an intimacy with two parties coming together. See, see, we don't have to misuse grace when we're connected to Jesus. Why? Your connection with Christ confirms that you're a new person. Through baptism, you become united with Christ through his death and his resurrection. See, we often end up misusing grace because while we want to connect to the suffering and the struggle that comes with dying to our sins, we also forget 
that now we're also connected to the power of a resurrected life. We also, we, we were always like, yeah, I'm dead. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. But we forget that we were actually connected to the resurrecting power that comes with living and being united in Christ. We have a power to live a renewed life. Somebody say amen. We have power to live a resurrected life. Somebody shout hallelujah. See, we can give God thanks because he's our Lord. We give God thanks because he's our Savior. We give God thanks because he's our confidant, right? We give God thanks because he's our advocate, hallelujah. We give God thanks because he's our example. We give God thanks because he's our master. We give God thanks because he's our counselor, hallelujah. And that's a good reason to give God praise. That's a good reason to give God glory. That's a good reason to shout and give God praise, right? But do I have at least 10 people in the house of God that want to take their praise just a little bit higher and you want to just throw up your hands real quick and say, Pastor Kim, I thank God that I'm even able to be joined at the hip with this Christ. I, I, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude that I, like a person like me, can even be united with Christ. I give God thanks because when I went down in that water, somebody remember when you got baptized? You remember when you got baptized and you publicly declared that I choose Jesus? By faith, I've, I am now identified. I am now connected. I am now united with Jesus Christ. Whatever is true of Jesus is true of me. Whatever is true of Jesus is true of you. Because you're united in him. Why do you have to keep on sinning? You're united. Let me help you. Imagine I have a, I have in my hand a cup of tea, okay? And in my other hand I have a sugar cube. Cup of tea, sugar cube. Tea, <laughs> sugar cube. The cup of tea... Sugar cube, they both exist separately, happily. They're fine by themselves. They're good. But once I add the sugar cube to the tea, you with me, Brother Caver. Once I add the sugar cube to the tea, the sugar cube is dissolved in the tea. Completely united. Completely lost in that tea. Uh, oh, I wish I had a church that was with me today. I I'll say it again. Once you add the sugar cube to the tea, it dissolves and becomes united with the tea. To the point that you can't even, you can't even see the sugar cube anymore. Oh, my goodness, brothers and sisters. When you are a follower of Christ, through faith and baptism, you become one with Christ. That's why the Bible says, alive to God in Christ. That's why Paul said, if anybody is in Christ, you're not a sugar cube anymore. You're tea. Where's the sugar cube? I don't know. I'm tea now, honey. You're a new creature. Somebody say hallelujah. So that means because we're in Christ, we're willing to make a change now because you're so connected. I mean, you, you have really no choice anymore. You're willing to do things differently because you're united. You used to offer up your body to sin, but now it's a different story because you're united. Is it the text? Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. This is good stuff. Therefore, what? Do not let control the way you live. Do not. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of to serve sin. Instead, completely to God, for you were, but now you have. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right to the glory of God. Woo! Yeah. 
This text confirms that Paul is not saying that because you're united that, you're gonna be, that you won't be tempted to sin anymore. That's not what he's saying. But rather, because we're united in Christ and dead to our sins, we should now continually present our bodies as instruments of righteousness. You're not going to misuse God's grace when moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, sometimes literally minute by minute, in light of an awareness that you are connected with Christ, now you can commit to offer your body as an instrument of righteousness. And I'm serious. For some of us, you literally have to do this thing minute by minute, hour by hour. If I could just make it to 12 12 o'clock and not cuss my boss out because I'm united in Christ. If I could just make it to 2 o'clock without saying anything crazy to my employees, woo, I'm united in Christ. Okay, good. I made it to the end of the day. Okay, now I'm about to drive home. God, since I'm connected to you, I'm going to just trust you and believe that I'm not going to cuss anybody out in this in this traffic. I'm going to hold my peace because I'm united in Christ now. Okay, praise the Lord. I made it home. Now I'm about to see my spouse and Lord, give me an extra dose. I'm about to see my kids. Give me an extra dose because I'm connected to you. But when you're connected with him and you recognize that moment by moment you use your body now as an instrument of righteousness somebody shout hallelujah how many of y'all love Idris Elba anybody sh- anybody shed some tears when he got married He's connected now. Go to the picture. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Such a a beautiful specimen. (laughs) Chocolate. He's connected now, though, brothers and sisters. He's united. And if he's serious about his connection, do I have any married folk in the house? When you're serious about your connection, <laughs> when you're serious about being united, you can't go back to the you can't go back to the stuff that you used to hang out with anymore. Do I have a witness? You are so connected, you have given your body literally in marriage to this person to the point that you're not about to give your body back to any of those old exes that you used to hang out with. Who says amen? He is off limits. So is she. It's fine. They're both not on the market because they're connected. Is there anybody off the market from the attack of the enemy? (laughs) Is there anybody off the market from the attack of Satan? Because you are so dissolved in the things of God, you are so connected to the things of God, that nothing, let no man pull you asunder because you are connected to Jesus Christ. Things are different now. I'm going to stay connected. I got to stay committed. So glad the Toronto team finally made it. Can we put our hands together, the Yahweh body? You made it for my last point. Yeah, we're, we're in and out here. We're, we in and out. <laughs> the last thing. So what is it, the first one? Remember that you're what? You're dead to sin. You're dead to it. Secondly, you are united with Jesus. Thank you, Sister Claire. Last one, remember you're under new management. You're under new management. Look at verse 19. Let me read it from here. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of what? To help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever into deeper, deeper into sin. Now, you must give yourselves to be what? Slaves to, wow, so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. See, you can do whatever you want to do when you, before you were saved. I can do whatever I want. 
And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. Things that end in the eternal do. But now you are, somebody shout free. Now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. I'm sure most of you know uh, Frederick Douglass. Go to the picture. He's the ab abolitionist, thank you, who grew up as a slave in Maryland in the early 19th century. Frederick Douglass, he experienced slavery for real, for real, brutal slavery. Uh, he was taken from his mother when he was only an infant. Uh, growing up, all he had to eat was that runny cornmeal, not the good kind, the runny kind, <laughs> dumped into a, a trough that kids fought to scoop out with oyster shells. He worked in the hot fields from before sunup until sundown. He was whipped many times with a cowhide whip until blood ran down his back. He was kicked. He was beaten by his master until he almost died. And he was attacked with a spike by a gang of white people. He was a slave. He was a real slave. His entire existence was to live to fulfill the commands of his master. Every whim, every desire, every urge that the master had, every impulse that his master had, any quirk, he was set to fulfill all of that. But even so, when Frederick considered trying to escape to freedom, he struggled with the decision. With all of that that he, that he experienced, he still struggled with the decision. He writes, you can read the book, it's called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. In that book, he reads, he says, he had two great fears. It's on the screen. The first was leaving behind his friends. I had a number of warm-hearted friends, he said, in Baltimore. Friends that I loved almost as I did my life. And the thought of being separated from them forever was painful beyond expression. He's talking about why it was hard for him to give up slavery. He goes on again, the second reason why it was hard for him, it is my opinion that thousands would escape from slavery who now remain, but for the, for the strong cords of affection that bind them to their friends. More people would have left slavery if they did not have that cord binding them. The second reason, if I failed in this attempt, my case would be a hope, hopeless one. It would seal my fate as a slave forever. That's why he was afraid. And this is the image, brothers and sisters, that Paul wants us to grasp about our sin. That before Jesus came into our lives, before we got saved, we were completely consumed, we were completely swallowed up, we were completely devoured, we were completely engulfed in the will of Satan, right? And we literally felt powerless to leave. Do I have a witness in this place? Some of us were even afraid to leave some things because we were afraid that we would not be able to overcome some of our addictions and some of our problems. We were afraid that we would, that we would have to give up some things that we actually really like. But when Jesus came on the scene, I said, when Jesus Christ came into our lives, I said, when Jesus came into our lives, do I have a witness? We were immediately emancipated. We were totally set free. No longer a slave to sin, but now free to serve the Most High God. Treasure Douglas, he put it like this. He said, when he finally tasted freedom. He said it was, like, it, was like, it was like one who had escaped a den of hungry lions. And I believe, I don't know who I'm talking to, I believe there's somebody in the room today that you know what freedom tastes like. Yeah, 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 you know what freedom feels like. <laughs> I don't know who it is, I know there's about maybe 10 of y'all. Because with the enemy no longer is authorized to control you. The enemy is no longer authorized to dictate your destiny. Now Jesus is the Lord over your life. He's the Lord over your life. Jesus is your master. You are now under new management. Somebody say amen. And it is the spirit of God that works in you. It is the spirit of God that energizes you to now live for him. That's why, brothers and sisters, 
We can't use grace as a license to keep on sinning because sin is no longer authorized to have its way in your life any longer. You used to be a slave to sin. You used to be a slave to anger. You used to be a slave to bitterness. You used to be a slave to lust. You used to be a slave to getting drunk all the time. But now you're a slave to Jesus Christ. Now you're a slave to his righteousness. Somebody ought to give God praise. Can somebody give God thanks? Because the, 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 the hold that Satan had on you is now broken, demolished, eradicated, dead to it, gone. We're free because we're under new management through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you, church. Happy Sabbath. Before we leave, I, I have a story to tell you that happened to me this week. Let me tell you what happened to me this week. I'm actually convinced that stuff happens to me just so I can preach about it. Because this never happened to me. Uh, somebody stole my bank card, Mom. Yeah. So you know what that means this weekend. <laughs> you got me. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Free money. Yeah, somebody stole my bank card this week. Uh, didn't even realize it was stolen. I guess I must have dropped it somewhere. I didn't even realize it. Uh, didn't realize it was stolen until I was awakened to my phone ringing off the hook. Because, see, I bank with Chase. Listen, Chase used to get on my nerves, but not anymore. I bank with Chase, and Chase's bank system is so finely tuned. Chase's bank system is so sophisticated because they immediately sensed that something wasn't right. I'm going to preach this thing how I feel it. They immediately sensed that something was off because uh, the time at which the transactions were happening was weird. The places that he was buying stuff from, uh, uh, the types of items that he was purchasing, <laughs> alerted the bank. I wish I had 10 people. Alerted Chase Bank that it could not possibly be Pastor Kimberly Bulgin. So they called me and said, um, Kimberly, we, we, we noticed some purchases. We noticed some purchases on your account, and, and we want to verify if it's really you. Because based on the purchase history, <laughs> y'all don't hear me. Based on the purchase history, based on the purchase history, that doesn't seem like you, Sierra. Uh, so they're like, they're like uh, we see a purchase uh, for straight talk airtime. And I was like, that ain't me. They're like, okay, uh, we, see, we see about, uh, about $300 being spent at Walmart. I was like, that's, sure. <laughs> that's definitely not me. <laughs> then they said, well, we see some money being spent at, 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 at a liquor store. And I said, brothers and sisters, that ain't me. That ain't me. And I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if I have about 25 people in the house of God today. Do I have somebody that can go with me today? Because you want to throw up your hands today and say, that ain't me either, honey. That ain't me. I don't care what the receipts say. I don't care what the purchase history says. I don't care what the history says. I don't care what the receipts say. That ain't me. I know that ain't me because I've been set free. I've, I, I'm a new creature in Christ. I, I'm dead to those sins. I, that ain't me. Yeah, I, I, I know I used to drink, but that ain't me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know I used to sleep around, <laughs> but that ain't me. <laughs> yeah, I know I used to be angry. I, I know I used to do some crazy things. But brothers and sisters, I promise you, that ain't me. I, I know I used to get high. Who am I preaching to in this place? I, I know I used to lie, but that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. That's not me. Can I tell you why? Because Jesus changed my life. I thought I would get more help right through there. 
that ain't me because Jesus changed my attitude. Jesus changed the way that I am. The things that I used to do, I don't find myself doing them anymore. The places that I used to go, I don't go to those places anymore. That ain't me. The things that I used to do, I don't do them no more. Touch somebody and say, that ain't me, that ain't me, that ain't me, that ain't me, that ain't me. That's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come on. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together, because that ain't me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. I'm going to give God praise, because that ain't me no more. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Why? Because that ain't me. It's not me anymore. That ain't me. I got to give him praise. I got to glorify him. I got to magnify him. See, some of y'all can't really give God praise on these kinds of messages because you don't have a, you don't have a pre-saved life. But there's a few of us in this grace community. You, you can say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> because when my past comes knocking on my door, I can look my past in the face and say, that ain't me. That's not me anymore. There's a difference in my life now. Evidence of a transformed life. That's why Chase knew to call me. There's an evidence here. Based on your previous transaction, this doesn't line up. And that's what the gospel will do to your life. It will render you unrecognizable. Anybody like gone back to your high school reunion or... <laughs> gone back to some of the places that you used to hang out and the people would be like, man, something's changed about you. Something's different about you. And herein lies the whole point of this message. Because you're changed, because you're different, you don't have to misuse God's grace. Do you see it now? You're a new person. You're dead to sin. You're united with Jesus. And you're under new management. The next time you're tempted, the next time your past comes creeping up, that ain't me. Literally. Go find somebody else. That's the kind of boldness we need to have. Because we're saved. So today my call, my call is actually for people that are saved today. I have another call later, but specifically my first call. Because he's talking to people that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But you've been using grace as an excuse to sin. You forgot that you're dead to it. You forgot that you're connected to Jesus now. Forgot that you're under new management. And you want to say, Pastor, I'm, the, I'm along with me. You want to say, God, I rededicate my life to you. Let's all stand over the room if that's you. I want to rededicate my life to you today. You're standing as an act of rededication. You're standing and you're saying, okay, okay, yeah. This week is going to be a different week because I know who I am. I'm saved. I'm justified. I'm a new creature. I've been through that rite of passage that we talked about earlier. And now that I've gone through that rite of passage, I'm literally not able to go back to the person that I used to be. Thank you, Lord. I want to live like Christ for real. I want to reflect his righteousness for real. Everything I give to you.
just right there where you're seated, just begin to say, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Let this be your song of dedication to the Lord. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. My past is behind me now. Withholding nothing. I surrender. Say. I surrender to you. Right where you are, just begin to surrender everything to your Lord. I everything. Thank you, Lord. I give. Yes, Lord. To you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Come on, let them know. I'm withholding nothing. Okay, I want to open up the altar specifically to pray, to pray for those, I was convicted this week, so no shame in here. I want to pray specifically for those, you feel your old self creeping back on you. Things that you thought were like done and finished are finding, are trying to weed its way back into your life. And you recognize through this message that you have to remind yourself, like, oh, no, 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 